Thank you for tuning in Cop with Comic. I'm Brian Cop, and we're with Comic Ellie Mason. Ellie Mason, how the hell are you? I am good. I am enjoying this fine winter afternoon, Saturday, lazy Saturday. How are you, Brian? You have not been outside yet, and I can tell you it's just uh, it's just a hellscape of snow out there. Oh, no, yeah. We ran out of coffee this morning. I sent my boyfriend out in the snow. Uh, so it's, he seemed very, uh, very soaked when he came back. But, uh, but your coffee shop was open. My Starbucks was closed. Oh, that's a bummer. Yeah, my coffee shop is just a, a Keurig pod. <laughs> <laughs> Got some Cafe Bustello. Oh, okay. So you went to the bodega and got like a coffee pod? Do they have coffee pods at bode- bodegas now? I think I think he may have gone to a supermarket. Uh-huh. Um, but I, I wouldn't I wouldn't put it past the bodegas in Williamsburg to have KK pods. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. Uh, we follow her everywhere. She's Ellie Mason, but instead of the O, she is a zero on Twitter. Ellie Mason with a zero. And then um, she has her own link tree, though. And that link tree is Ellie Mason. And on Instagram, she is from Concentrate. And I think you run a weekly mic. Tell us about that, because we're going to be talking a little bit about things like equitable booking, um, especially with marginalized communities and things like that, which are wonderful topics that you suggested and I couldn't be more interested in. Yes. So our weekly mic is at Pine Box Rock Shop, uh, one of you know my favorite venues in Brooklyn. Um, it's a really great place. Um, they are... You know, their their whole staff is so, so kind and they've been so wonderful to us, especially dealing with this pandemic. But our mic is called um, Married at First Mike. It is the only reality TV themed mic in New York City. Okay. Uh, <laughs> you don't have to talk about reality TV to go up, um, but it is just like sort of like a fun thing that you can do. Um and yeah, and then, you know, at the end, we all are legally married after the mic, <laughs> by the end of the mic, that's, you know, that's what you sign up for when you put your name in a bucket, it's, a bucket. <laughs> it's three minutes. Um, you have, well, you have to be careful about who you're kind of drawing in. I mean, if the wrong open micer shows up, I mean, you're screwed, you're married forever. Oh, yeah, no, well, this is why we have the uh, annulments. Uh, <laughs> we, have, we have lawyers on hand ready okay. to to act if anything goes south but yeah we actually have a very lovely crowd of people that come out um everyone is so nice and yeah it's just a great place to be it's a really supportive we are you know especially something that's really important to us is you know making sure beginners feel welcome there too and it's a really great place to start out too and we're actually having a um this was the idea of the the Pine Box uh, owners, but we're having like a comedy roundtable March 1st at 8.30. And that's, you know, primarily targeted towards people who are, you know, trying to get into comedy. It was supposed to be sort of like a New Year's thing, but um, COVID. So uh, we so had- So how's it a round table? Uh, so it's going to be um, me and my co-host, Ryan, who run that mic, and the hosts of all the other mics there. <laughs> How many how many hosts of mics are there going to be at this roundtable? Um, I think six. Okay. Something like that. So yeah. what is it though? I mean, are y'all just going to like do a set or like how is it a roundtable? Oh table? no no no! It's kind of more of like a um, oh like, like a panel discussion. Yeah yeah yeah. That yeah. is cool. And then like yeah. like people are trying this out. They're like, I want to come listen to them because yeah, people... I'll know kind of how to do an open mic and what to try there and what not to try. Definitely okay. yeah, and just like you know sort of. Uh, uh, like you know some tips and tricks and all that kind of good stuff you know um and and also just you know sort of encouraging people to come out um I think it's really part of the reason why we really like you know appealing to beginners is because I think a lot of times you know people can get you know sort of iced out of comedy if you know because it is you know sort of like a boys club and sort of a you know there's a lots of you know kind of dark shit that goes on in comedy um so, yeah, we just really like to make sure that everyone feels comfortable there. Yeah, because I think uh, one of the comics had tweeted something like that. Like, one of my former guests, I thought it was John Marco, he said something like, when, uh, when, when, I, when I hear a writer is booked and the writer goes up, I know something interesting is going to happen. Like, meaning comedy writers, they get up and they're not used to, like, not getting laughs after everything they say. You know, like, <laughs> you, you submit articles and things like that, you could deal with the rejection, but can you deal with the lack of laughs? And I, I would think it might be a scarring experience for certain people who might be pretty prolific and successful at comedy writing. 
Oh, but definitely. if they get up in the wrong room and they have a traumatizing experience or whatever, um, it must be pretty difficult to get back up there a second time. Definitely. Yeah, I will admit to having like a little bit of short and short and fraud or whatever that German word is when I see like <laughs> a late night writer bomb. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, it is really interesting when you talk about like the writer comics, too, because I think, you know, the way I feel like, you know, there's like the writer comics and then there's more of the, you know, like personality kind of cult personality type comics. And um, you can definitely see the disappointment, you know, when someone writes a joke and you know it just doesn't go the way they wanted to and how could it i mean because you know even like because like the the first time i did a stand-up comedy it was open mic in chicago full room of normal people and i killed and i had no yeah i just kind of improv it winged it and i just killed and then you move to new york and it's just a couple of stand-up comedians in the room and it's just like it couldn't be more different because you're just like playing to an audience of like people who aren't listening are half concentrating even if they are listening and it's pretty difficult to figure out if something gets a real laugh and so like something that should be funny like meaning their article is funny this this comedy writer's article is objectively funny and you know thousands of people are enjoying it but that mm-hmm. doesn't mean that you're going to get like these jaded people in, a, in an audience to pay attention and to care right yeah definitely i think the the killing in your hometown scene to bombing in new york pipeline is is very very real but i think i mean it, I, and I don't even think it's hometown because i don't know anybody in the audience it's just oh, whether or not you have yeah. a real audience it's like yeah. do you have a real audience of normal ass people who are there to have a good time and are half you know might have a couple drinks in them definitely. and paying attention a little bit because they walked into a comedy club it's just like dude where can you even find that yeah in in new york city i guess certainly not an open mic unless you have a supportive open mic and it sounds like you do definitely and we honestly even sometimes get you know kind of like bar people wandering in every once in a while or like um yeah at our last mic we had this guy there and he was he was what i would consider like a nice heckler um so you know like he's not like you know trying to be rude or anything he just doesn't understand that like the format of comedy is like oh, the person with the microphone is the one that talks, you know? Um, But I think, honestly, that can be really interesting. And I think that can be, like, a very good, like, it's like leg day in in the comedy room. (laughs) But it's easy, you know? It's not The glorious leg day. Yeah. I love that shit. I've never heard of it, but that's wonderful. The leg day of comedy. (laughs) (laughs) Is is the nice hecklers, yeah. And then the, the actual hecklers are, like, abs where you're just, like, cannot walk the next day (laughs) (laughs) it's perfect but i think that i mean it can open up stage brain like all of these people have just been writing for a living like they don't know what fear can do for their comedy you know just fucking abject dread and you're like i have no idea what to say next oh i just thought of something oh shit this just just unlocked a new chunk because of this heckler Mm -hmm. and it's really nice when you deal with those kinds of hecklers because you're not your brain doesn't automatically go to like oh I need to own this guy you know comedian owns heckler at an open mic you know like I don't need to you know show him who's boss you know when it's like just someone who's talking to you you know you can just you can just talk to them and see where it goes it's like low pressure I think but what do you what do you anticipate that this panel discussion will kind of unveil or reveal to you as you kind of you know do open mics you know going forward and you you know host you know kind of start up huge you know bar shows and you know tiny cupboard shows riff shows and all that shit like what do you think um what do you think you'll learn from others and what have you learned with respect to kind of creating a safe space for marginalized communities in comedy definitely that's a good question i think um probably one of the biggest things i want to learn from the round table is kind of like how other people run their mic to um, especially I think I'm pretty sure there is a um, a queer mic that goes on in Pine Box there used to be one on Thursdays too but I'd love to get like a little more insight on how they run um, their mic and you know I think just like hearing from different because I, I think a lot of the uh, a lot of the mics you know they're they're based on you know the different identities of the host you know they they know how best to cater to the needs of different communities and so i think it'll be really insightful because of the host you get dylan adler up there and you're like yeah this is going to be a dylan adler show where everybody's going to kind of follow suit and be as uh, flamboyant as they want do that do backflips and shit Mm -hmm. (laughs) so great uh always a treasure to to see him out in the wild
I think it's out in LA now. So I was like, oh, really? I'm gonna come up with some LA shows, right? Because I just had wow. some LA comedians on who uh, who have their own shows. But then I see his uh, his shows, and it's just like he's you know he's fucking on the bill with some of the biggest names. And then, ah, he's you know I mean the Lucas Brothers his first show. <laughs> LA, and just, you know, I think he's been there before, but it's just so funny to you know I've also seen him at the the park in Astoria, and he's still doing backflips there. And he's just, yeah. just he's as funny wherever you see him, which is how everybody should be. Yeah, that's a great. He's got a better, much better work ethic than I do. <laughs> but then also, he kind of did it. He recently tweeted uh, a picture of this. It was a, a video of uh, Pel- what is it, Seagull doing backflips over and over again. <laughs> he goes, "This Seagull stole my whole act." And I'm like, mm-hmm. "Yeah." Meaning, I mean, like, if we see you do backflips once, it's like you know, the second time you see it, it might not be as, uh, not might not be as rewarding. But how can Allie Mason make sure that she is the Dylan Adler? of her own mic and of the comedy scene in general like what are you doing with your set to match the backflips of a dylan adler if you can't backflip okay so i can't backflip i can't <laughs> what? flip you so, can you can kick flip skateboard yeah. would you say yeah so that is i guess i could bring my board out on stage i honestly you can that, actually kick flip on a skateboard yeah it's that tough. i that's like one of my favorite i think that's actually like part of the reason why like over the past year even though it has been like pandemic still and there's been you know definitely like a slowdown in comedy I think that's been one of the reasons why I've been like not spending as much time doing comedy just because I have this other thing that I love and we actually have a group of comics that skate and then me and my other friend Allison who Allison O'Connor who's also a comic um we run like a queer and women skate sesh um (laughs) and we get a lot of comics out it's really fun I can't believe queer women skateboarding I can't (laughs) believe you found a Venn diagram overlap Oh my gosh. Yeah, it's like... How many are in it? I gotta know how many are in this Venn diagram overlap. So many. Um, (laughs) There's actually like a lot of comics that skateboard. I mean, like of all different identities. um, Ethan Victor was talking about, I'm just like, dude, Ethan Victor, how old are you, dude? It's like you're still skating, but I think he's just super young. I'm so old that I'm talking to these comedians who are still 20 and still able to skateboard pretty successfully. Dude, uh, like, I think it's Tim Robinson who can tray flip. I'm like... (laughs) There's and Mark Norman too has a video out of like him skating at Tompkins. Yeah, I think I've seen that one. It's Comment. so crazy that like well like I was I was actually having this conversation with my friend um, at my last mic this week. Um, he skates too and does comedy and like we were talking about how you know we skate you know and it messes up your body physically and then like when you need a break from skating you get more into comedy which just like messes you up mentally. That is wonderful. Oh my gosh, I can't believe, I mean, in order to like develop all these muscles, you have to both skate and do stand-up comedy, I think, Mm -hmm. which is why there's so many queer women skaters in New York City, I guess. Definitely. Well, I think both skateboarding and comedy, there's this like, there's this intersection that I think is especially helpful for people of, of these like marginalized communities that, you know, I think especially like, you know, I, I can't speak to identities I like all these identities but especially for me as a woman you know like it's in comedy so I guess there's this like there's this uh fact which is I think one of the reasons why where like the myth like women aren't funny comes from because women are statistically less likely to attempt a joke like they will probably make you know one attempt at a joke for like every 10 you know so men fail more often but because they try so many times there's a like, higher rate of success and I think it's like sort of the same in skateboarding. There was this study done where, you know, parents were more likely to encourage a male child to overcome like a physical obstacle, like monkey bars or something like that, whereas they were more likely to even like physically remove women. So I think doing these things that, you know, involve a lot of risk taking and involve, you know, kind of being in these qualities that you're like socialized to not have is really, really empowering. And so I think that's why I'm really passionate about, you know, making these, these uh, worlds more accessible to people who I think could really benefit from it. But what do you do now? Like now that you, you know, big corporate gig or whatever, like, or when you get a corporate gig <laughs> yeah. or wherever you're at in your career, like when you can't tweet out every reckless, you know, if you're a risk risk seeker, yeah. I suppose you can't take as many risks at least online, but you can do so in the room. Definitely, yeah, and that's why it's been like really helpful. It's been really a bummer. I've actually had my socials on private for the past like five months while I had this job search because I was so worried that yes. 
someone was going to see my tweets saying like, I want to be the Joey Chestnut of Molly. And like, it'd be like <laughs> <laughs> oh, we can't hire this girl. She's uh, too much of a genius. Uh, no, they're like, do we want to hire this girl? She's going to, she's going to deal with Molly. This she's morning. going to, she's going to take all our Molly. Yeah. <laughs> she's going to, she's going to max out the 401 Molly match. <laughs> the 401 Molly match. That is wonderful. I mean, like, are you doing that in your comedy? Like, because that's a perfect example of how you've taken something corporate. That's actually made, a made good idea. Yeah. yeah I, uh, so it, that's funny you say that, too, because our last mic, too, there was someone who did, like, a set, and it was kind of, like, a bunch of, like, corporate jokes like that. He had just gotten laid off, and uh, he made, he, he was, like, a, something like a media coordinator or something. He's like, you'll never find a coordinator. Like, I don't know, just, all, it was really fun, just, like, sort of, just satirizing how mundane and like meaningless <laughs> the, the the entire world of corporate labor is you know <laughs> but yeah it is really funny I mean maybe you struggle with this too I mean I'm just kind of finding out because I've literally just got my first corporate job like this week and like it's so weird I'm like so nervous that they're gonna like look at my Twitter and just see something I've tweeted and it, it feels like really like suffocating you know especially part of the reason why you get into comedy you know especially as as someone you know growing up I felt like you know women are taught that you know they should be quiet and not speak up and you know I'm really I really love the idea of just being able to say whatever I want and feeling those restrictions just uh doesn't feel good you know mentally yeah but I mean you, you need to walk like a perfect balance because you need to have like have money Definitely. You have to pr yeah. promote the mic and to make sure that you're, the bar you're at is perfectly safe for marginalized communities. Like this stuff kind of takes a little bit of money. Mm -hmm. And I've always just like, you know, I had a job where I was a lawyer and I had a lot of time but not a lot of money. It sounds weird, but then now I'm a paralegal and I have a lot more money and less time. And so you need a perfect mix of, you know, money and time and things like that. And if you don't have one, it can be pretty difficult. And so, I mean, as long as you're keeping balance, and I wonder if anybody else will try to dig too hard on your socials, because then you'll dig on theirs, right? Like, yeah. like, like whoever is gatekeeping this, you're like, do we really want to open this can of worms? It's tough <laughs> enough to retain talent in this hot, hot labor market. And mm -hmm. if we start firing everybody because of a shitty tweet, let's just not look, let's just not look, right? No, yeah, my my co-host who I run the mic with actually got in trouble with his work for tweeting something. Um, <sighs> It was, it was work related and it was uh, while well, he was on the clock. So um, oh. technically I could see why they would be upset, but. Yeah, as long as you don't disparage, right? Like you probably yeah. have some sort of non-disparagement clause where like, dude, you can't talk shit. Like you don't have to post cool shit about your work, but don't post uncool shit. Yeah, it just feels so weird that, you know, it just feels like that should be a private thing. Yes. But I guess the internet isn't really that private. Yeah, and once you make it private, you like the engagement goes down to zero. You really need to interact with some people. Like, if I can't retweet Allie Mason's funny stuff, oh uh, Allie Mason with a zero instead of the O, oh, what am I going to do? Like, can people sign up for your newsletter, and what's that going to entail? No, yeah, definitely. It's like, you know, if a, if a tree falls and no one laughs at it in the floor, yeah, you know, it's, <laughs> there's, I literally, like, while I had my, my Twitter on private for the past five months, I tweeted probably, like, I don't know, le like a couple times a week versus like, you know, when I'm at the top of my game, it's like three to five per day, you know, trying to try, trying to hit that that first 5K and then up from there. I would love to get discovered on Twitter. I, will, I don't know if that's, you know, well, you know, we're working on it. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, it's just, I mean, now that you're just you're suffocated by the corporate mantle, like how, you know, I guess, I mean, it kind of is like trying to do stand-up comedy for late night or whatever. Yeah. Right? It's a clean set, but it still needs to be edgy enough or surprising enough to be funny. So it could give you know, that sort of discipline and limitation could be the, uh, the thing that kind of unlocks the forever fountain for your tweets, which will be discovered and viral, right? Definitely. That's kind of like what I'm trying to, I'm trying to like combine my job life career life with my like comedy life and you know I guess like corporate gigs are like a huge thing if I could come up with like 45 on corporate shit I'm sure I'm sure that would you know make me coast for the next decade or so until we have like I don't know like a new Microsoft or something come out and I have to like update and I'm like zoom and everyone's like what zoom you know? but, but I mean I like are you even letting people know that you're a stand-up comedian because you know they might have no reason to look 
Actually, yes, I did. I think my my job is like a little unique in that stand up comedy is very um, like it's a, an asset to it. I'm a copywriter, and I think that a lot of comedians are copywriters, and it's like very well like known in that world that um, that is like a like that's the day job of a of a lot of comics who are like you know who fancy themselves to be like writer comics. Um, cause it's like a lot, a lot of it is like the same, you know, it's like, it's, it's, it's weird. It's like art, but make it capitalism. Like co- you know, to get the genius of the content person, you have to deal with some sort of skeletons in the Twitter closet, right? Like if they're going to get yeah. Alan Johnson, you know, Definitely. being their content coordinator or whatever, like they're going to have to put up with a little bit of hilarious that's edgy on Twitter, right? Yeah, and I think I've like I I definitely need to do like a deep dive into my Twitter and make sure I like get any like you know lingering like bad tweets that are like probably like to, I don't know just like tweeting about drugs or something like that is you know probably not something that could be I don't think there's anything like too bad but it's it's just it's just weird because you know you never know what's gonna set someone off. But like some loser will do it for you. Like people trying to cancel you have nothing else to do. Oh yeah. Than looking through your shit. You know what? I mean, the easier way to do it, besides going through thousands of hilarious tweets, that you'll just be. I mean, by by the tenth one, you'll just be laughing so hard. You're like, <laughs> I'm not taking any of these down. These are such trolls. They represent where it was at the time. But you can also just add something simple to your bio, like tweeted by an intern or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or like <laughs> these don't reflect all persons living or dead. Um, is she dead? Yeah. yeah dis- a disclaimer. I love that. You're so corporate. You have a disclaimer in your Twitter bio. Yeah. But we follow her everywhere. She is <laughs> Ellie Mason with a zero and from Concentrate on Instagram. But also lit- the link tree makes it easy and it's Ellie Mason there. There's a newsletter button there that will take you to a place where you can sign up. And how often are you uh, sending out your, your newsletter now that you're corporate? Um, I am trying to get back to bi monthly. Um, I, you know, I'm, I've been slacking a little bit, but, um, hopefully we will get back up there. (laughs) And when's the next mic? It's called Uh, Mary. Is it called Married at First Mike? Married at First Mike. Yes. It's every Tuesday at Pine Box Rock Shop at 6 PM and it's a bucket. Okay. And if I don't, I mean, does everybody, is everybody guaranteed a spot then? Is that necessarily true with a bucket? Yes. Everyone is guaranteed a spot. We haven't had any issues so far. Usually there's, um, I mean, this last one, it was a little bit uh, under in attendance because we had just taken like, I think, six weeks off. And I, I think maybe people didn't know we were back because of any shutdown. Yes. But um, yeah, usually there's about like 30 to 40 people that show up. Um, the so magic usually, word there is three minutes, right? Yeah, three minutes. <laughs> and usually it's about like a two hour mic. And, you know, if you have like another show or anything, you can always stop by. Uh, as long as you don't abuse this privilege, you know, we, we work with people to make sure they can get where they're going. Yeah, skater die, dude. What's the what's yeah. the queer comedian female New York City way of saying skater die? What's the woke way of skating saying it? Um, skate and die. Skate and die. I love it so much, Allie Mason. Thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, thank you for having me. This is fun.